Hello and welcome, America. It is Eric Erickson here from my flagship station, WSB in Atlanta, Georgia, out of the bunker and in the studio with people. I'm with you, and I got a guest. This is actually the very first person I've ever had in this studio. He's running for the United States Senate, and I, I, in all honesty, I'm not just saying this because you're sitting here, uh, literally, I have had more requests to have you on the program as a candidate than any of the other candidates. And so here you are starting these conversations with candidates across the state of Georgia running for the U.S. Senate. Kelvin King joins me. Welcome. Hello, Eric. Uh, thanks for having me here. I'm excited about it. So as I said to, to all the campaigns, I just we've got the eyes of the nation on Georgia a uh, number of candidates running. One gets a lot of attention. The other's not so much. All of you have incredible bios. And so, uh, Kelvin King, here's your chance. Tell the audience, who are you? Well, sure. Thanks a lot, Eric. Uh, I mean, I'm a Georgia native, born and raised here in Georgia, born in Macon, Georgia. Uh, my mom was only 15 years old when she when she had me, and clearly I was unplanned. But I thank them for seeing value in my life, which informs my pro-life position. Uh, when I was about eight years old, we moved from Cobb County, I mean, from Bibb County to Cobb County. And a couple years after that, uh, the wheels fell out the wagon and my father uh, started doing drugs and domestic violence in the, in the, in the home uh, caused him to have to leave. Eventually was imprisoned and you know, it was just my mom and my little sister uh, and it was tough. Uh, thank God for grandmothers. My grandmother retired early from Robbins Air Force Base and helped us out with food and money, and I was able to finish high school. I was in the Talented and Gifted program and finished with honors and gained an appointment to the U.S. Air Force Academy, and my life changed after that. And at the academy, I, uh, you know, that, that's a four-year college, and I actually played football in college, and I know that there's another football player in my race, so I tell people, you know, if that's important to you, um, I was also an all-conference college football player, so uh, <laughs> I check out that box. But anyway, uh, after graduation from the U.S. Air Force Academy, I went into the the real Air Force. I was a contracting officer in the Air Force. And for those who don't know what that is, my job was uh, government procurement, uh, government spending. Uh, I know fiscal matters. At the time, I thought it was a good job to transition to corporate America. But now I see it was a perfect job for a U.S. Senate seat, especially in this time of hyper spending and this inflationary period. And uh, after I did my service commitment, I went into corporate America for 10 years and I got this itch. Uh, I wanted to start my own company. And, um, you know, see what this whole American dream thing was all about. So I started my own construction company. I started by myself from scratch in a bedroom of my home. And that first year, I made enough money to move all the way to the basement of my home. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I know a lot of people know about those basement businesses. But uh, we were able to grow. And now I own a 12,000-square-foot building over near the Brave Stadium. And I'm just real real focused and proud of uh, uh, the accomplishments that I was able to achieve. And, you know, that's why I'm running. I want to make sure that this is – available and possible for every American. Now, I, I, I got to ask you just out of the gate here, as I told you, I don't have a script. I don't have questions. We just go where the conversation leads. What part of Bibb County since since I'm there? <laughs> yeah, I was I was born in Macon Coliseum Hospital. Uh, so I was born in Macon and uh, I, I went to Durrisville Elementary uh-huh. and Hunt Elementary. I, you know, I, I when I was actually uh, when I was in college, I did volunteer mentoring at Hunt Elementary School. Oh, my goodness. Yep, sure yeah. did. Good grief. Wow. And, and then up to Cobb. Okay, so you you know then just listening to your story, uh, which I was familiar with, um, not as in as much detail as you've just given the audience. The the strains on families, particularly single moms, and we have a lot in Georgia right now. And we also seem to have these ideas out there uh, by the opposition that we need to. Not necessarily in, in improve people's lot in life if we can just subsidize the condition that they seem to be in, which seems to me to actually maybe hold people back more than it should. Yeah, that's an interesting interesting question. Uh, obviously, we're compassionate. Uh, America is the most compassionate country in, on the globe in terms of us uh, our giving. But I, you know, really, what I think every American want is an opportunity. You know, we, we, we want a chance uh, to, to kind of make our way and make our course in this world. Uh, I believe in self-determination, uh, but I also, know, I also know the government does have a role. Uh, the role uh, is probably not as involved as a, as a Democrat would think, but um, I do think the government has a role to, to create those types of environments for our own individual American dreams to manifest. And, uh, you know, that's really you know, why I jumped into this race. Uh, I believe that the American dream is under attack right now. Uh, I believe that the Biden administration is uh, really collapsing our economy. 
Uh, they're weakening our military, and it's causing strife internally amongst people and families. And you know, as long as as long as we have clarity, particularly in small business, as long as we have a little bit of, little, little bit of clarity and and um, uh, um, a, a stable environment. You can make your way in America. You can, you can figure out what you want to do and do what you want to do. And, and you know, I'm, I'm running to preserve their freedoms and opportunities and American exceptionalism. I call those the, 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 the three tenets or the, the three-legged stool of the American dream. I want to make sure that that is in place for not just my children, um, but also future generations. Now, let's go to your, your construction business because you got to see, and if you wouldn't mind talking about just uh, how you've seen during COVID shutdown, the shift from administrations, the economic impact on your business. Oh, yeah. Um, COVID hit me hard. I mean, frankly, I got scared. Uh, when, the first time I was ever scared uh, in my company, and I sat with my wife, and you know, we prayed, and we said, you know, the Lord will make a way. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, so I understand the challenges of how COVID hit our, our business in, industry. But, you know, frankly— the issue, the problems that we are encountering today are not COVID caused. Yes, COVID was a problem, but the governmental response to COVID is really what caused the problem that problems that we're in right now. This hyperinflation, these supply chain disruptions, and uh, this this council culture that's permeating our 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 entire country is causing strife. Like I said, amongst you know. Americans that's been friends for years. I mean, this is insane what we're seeing. And, and, what, and what we need is truth to be spoken. Uh, that's why I'm running in this race. I, I, I see Raphael Warnock as, a, um, as someone who does not uh, uh, benefit from good relations amongst our fellow Americans. I think that they push strife and they, and they, and they, and they benefit from strife, strife. Uh, because that is how they create this us versus them uh, mindset, and that is dangerous for our country, and it's destructive to our republic. Yeah, isn't it remarkable that uh, I see his puppy dog ads, and yet when I see his policies that he's advanced in Washington, the abortion on demand, we've got to take away uh, people's rights to determine their governmental representatives for themselves and have Washington take over redistricting and stuff. He's <laughs> he's way more divisive in what he supports than what the puppy dog ads seem to show. Yeah, I, I, I think he does a great job of messaging. Uh, he runs great ads. Uh, I think that helped him in, in the last election against uh, Senator Leffler. Uh, but the, you know, the truth is, you know, he, he stands in line with the Biden administration. He pushes for divisive policies like a $4 billion carve out just for black farmers. I don't think that's right. I think that's racist. And he also pushes for abortion. He considers himself a pastor and he's pro-choice. Now, I'm not I'm not a pastor myself, but I do know how to read the Bible. And, and the word says God knew us in the womb. And if, if, if that is what the word says, I don't understand how he can interpret that as being pro-choice. So these are a few questions that I have for Mr. Warnock when I get on stage with him to be, to debate him. Now, you know, you mentioned getting on stage with, with Warnock. It's We got this Republican field, <laughs> uh, and I, I'm just, I, I wanted to give every one of you in, 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 uh, one of the 2 o'clock hours here so everybody across the state and the nation could hear you. And when you look at the field, the way it shapes up, I mean, I, we'll keep going back to this question throughout this hour, but why you over everyone else? Well, I mean, frankly, I am the most well-rounded candidate in this race. My, my resume polls higher than any other candidate in this race. And I can debate on one of the main attacks that the Democrats are going to give to us. They're going to hit us with social issues and cultural issues. That's where they typically put us on our heels and we're typically playing defense. Well, this is an area where I excel. I mean, I'm, I'm strong on foreign policy. I'm strong on domestic policy and our economy. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm strong on immigration policy, but I'm also strong in debating the social issues. See, I've been a Republican for over 25 years, and uh, oftentimes in black families, you know, we, 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 we vote Democrat, but we have conservative values. And when you become a Republican, when you make a statement and you come out as a Republican in black families, you better learn how to defend yourself and, and, and protect your position and make your statements. And I've been doing this for over 25 years. And I look forward 
to having these types of uh, engagements with not just Warnock, but any Democrat out here who wants to spew lies or, 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 or push narratives that are destructive in nature um, to our communities and to our country. So now that raises a question. Um, you are a uh, black, successful businessman. How did you become a Republican? Because <laughs> on the demographic checkbox, I mean, your your average national reporter is going to say, well, this guy's got to be a Democrat. And yet here you are. In fact, you were on stage with President Trump in 2020. <laughs> yes, I've been on stage with President Trump twice, actually. And my, my wife has twice. And I'm glad you asked that question because it's some, somewhat of a unique answer. Uh, in college, I was reading... You know, frankly, I was reading black history books in college uh, in, in my spare time. Uh, I was going through my, my period of trying to understand uh, you know, black history and, 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 and our culture. And I, I got really, really engaged with a guy named Booker T. Washington. And, and, I, and, and I was really impressed by a guy named Frederick Douglass. And at that point, I was telling myself, I was like, hey, I think I'm a Republican, not a Democrat, because these <laughs> principles are the principles that I've grown up with and I know work. And um, that's when I converted, to be, to be frank with you. And uh, it, it hadn't let me down since. Uh, I believe that a lot of my success is uh, attributed to uh, the, the, the mindset and the principles that uh, Booker T. Washington uh, espouses. And I believe that every American, not just black, but every American can benefit from these teachings. In fact, I encourage everyone, if you hadn't read Up From, Up from Slavery, you got to read it. Mm-hmm. Every American needs to read up from slavery to give them give them a better perspective about some of the historical uh, consequences of uh, you know of slavery. I, I, I'm glad you mentioned Booker T. Washington because everybody talks about Frederick Douglass, but I just I, I've always liked that guy. I mean, just what an amazing first of all the background, the biography, the things he accomplished, and and the things he wrote is one of those things where everybody that's someone everybody should read. I don't care who you are on what country you live in, you should be reading him. Yes, sir, I agree wholeheartedly. Okay, we're going to take a timeout here. I'm going to fire off the button. So I, I got to tell you, if y'all could see us in the office, I hadn't had a haircut in a month and a half. And here I thought I'm not going to make any of the candidates wear headphones because I don't want to mess up their hair. Well, I mean, we, we, you, you, be- <laughs> yeah, you don't have to worry about that with me. <laughs> so, But that's all right. You're not going to hear the sounder, but I'm going to play it. I will be right back. Uh, nationwide, you're listening to The Eric Erickson Show. I've got in studio with me for the full hour, Kelvin King running for the U.S. Senate in Georgia. Welcome back. It is Eric Erickson here. I, I kind of enjoy this having a guest in studio with me. And I mean, I like talking to Jim, but I, I got Kelvin King with me. He's running for the U.S. Senate in Georgia. And during the commercial break, we were talking about something I'm glad he hit on because I probably would not have uh, even thought to bring it up. But it's true. The Democrats in Georgia are trying for this historic moment idea. So in 2014, those of you outside of the state or you don't remember, you had the heirs message from the Democrats. You had the heir of Jimmy Carter, his son running for governor. You had the heir of Sam Nunn, his daughter running for the Senate. We were going to take the heirs of the Georgia dynasties and get them like, and it didn't work. And now they're trying to do it again, but this time it's black female gubernatorial candidate, black first black man to represent Georgia in the Senate. It's this history moment. We had a red wave sweep through Georgia in 2006, and the rest of the country went blue. And now could Georgia have a blue wave while the rest of the country goes red? Uh, your thoughts on this one? Yeah, I'm glad we, um, we, we actually are on this topic because it's one that I'm trying to make sure that I'm clear on and I can share with as many Republicans as possible. It's not a foregone conclusion that the red wave will carry Georgia. Um, and what I mean is that the Warnock Abrams ticket. We have to think about the Warnock Abrams ticket. They're running on a ticket of of, of history and making history with the first black senator, first black uh, uh, governor. Uh, they're also rub, r- running off of symbolism, and um, they have intentionally worked to try to disconnect themselves with the Biden administration. If you recall earlier this year when Biden and Harris came to visit Georgia, <laughs> uh, Abrams uh, neither Abrams nor Warnock wanted to be seen in public with them. So to a certain voter base, you know, their, their, their Democratic base and maybe a few independents, they're messaging that uh, we're not like Biden because we all know Biden is, is crashing. And he's, he's crashing every area of our government. And they're trying to show themselves as separate from the Biden failure. And it's going to be important for the Senate candidate that comes out of our primary they have to be a strong candidate. They have to be able to withstand the attacks that's coming from the Democrats, but they also have to be able to go on offense and, and attack those Democrats. And if you can't debate on these social issues like uh, racial issues or, or 
voting rights or, or health care uh, uh, concerns or education. If, if you don't have good uh, uh, responses on those topics, we put ourselves in a position to lose. That is really the main message I want to give to Republicans. We've got to select a candidate out of this primary who's strong on all these topics, who can't be brought down from, you know, an old picture with someone and now he's <laughs> racist. You know, they're going to try every trick in the book. And a strong, well-rounded candidate is the only candidate that can defeat Raphael Warnock at this moment. So, you know, you bring that up and, and I, I, I'm going to have to do clock adjustment here and, and, and management here. But I, I got to ask you about this because you say that and – you and I both know the Democrats will have pictures of you and Donald Trump on stage together and, and saying you're some sort of sellout to the black community. And, and I mean, they if, if you're not with them, you're a racist, and it doesn't matter whether you're black or white. Well, it, it, it won't work on me, Eric. Uh, yes, I do have pictures of me on stage with President, twice, President Trump twice. Uh, and I've also increased the black vote for President Trump mm-hmm. in 2020. Uh, you do that not by... Um, uh, uh, you know, making a show of it, but by talking about real hard topics and giving real hard solutions. You know, m- every community in our country, I'm not, I'm not going to distinguish black or whatever. Every community is looking for a few things. They, they want to be able to educate them, ki- their, educate their kids uh, the way they want their kids to be educated. They want to be able to make a living for them, fa- for, them for themselves and their family, and they want to be safe, live in safe communities. Everyone wants the same thing. I'm just able to deliver that message with a Republican or conservative wrapping around it, because I can show that, hey, I have a shared experience with a lot of these communities. I understand the challenges and the concerns, and I know what works to get out of these communities. And if you're not able to articulate these types of uh, 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 messages, we put ourselves at a disadvantage. You know, the Republican Party is a, is a strong party. I mean, originally, we, we were founded uh, to come out of uh, slavery, to end slavery. The Republican Party has strong um, uh, Faith beliefs, strong defense beliefs, strong uh, self-protection beliefs, strong economic beliefs. This is what most Americans want. And and I am a candidate that could speak to a broad electorate. Now, when we come back, I actually want to start talking about those issues and uh, just give you time to prepare. I want to talk about the crime issue first because it kind of connects the entire state. And agriculture, there's so much here. It is Eric Erickson here across the nation from Atlanta, Georgia, where the eyes of the political universe are on the state. We've got a giant gubernatorial primary where national outlets are obsessing over it. And you also have, well, the control of the Senate in 2021. In the runoff, uh, 427,205 Republicans stayed home, getting Raphael Warnock and John Ossoff elected. And now the Republicans want Warnock's seat back. He was finishing out the term of the late Senator Johnny Isaacson. One of those running as a Republican is Kelvin King. He joins me in studio. And now we got time to talk about the issues here. This is actually one of the reasons I love doing this is, is we get a half an hour for you to really tell your story and then a half an hour to really talk about the issues that matter. And... I was talking to Matt Dolan the other day. He's uh, running for the Senate in Ohio. And I said, what is your Ohio issue, not your national issue? Because everybody talks about it. He says, actually, it is fentanyl is his big issue because they're having massive deaths in Ohio. It's so he's legal immigration from the border. It is an Ohio issue. Here in Georgia, uh, I want to actually talk about what your issue is. But before, as as I was telling you, I want to ask you about crime because wherever I go – I've got rural affiliates. I've got urban affiliates. Everybody calls in. Everybody has the sense of uh, worry about crime in their community right now. Well, Eric, um, when 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 you when you hear leaders, uh, Democratic leaders, uh, pushing defund the police for years, when you're when you hear Democratic leaders uh, uh, demoralizing our law enforcement uh, community, uh, and then you see lack of convictions and lack of uh, bringing these bad actors and criminals to justice, you will get an increase in crime. And that's exactly what we're seeing right now. And I, I say that it was it was pushed from far left progressive narratives when it comes to being able to protect yourselves or 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 or, or protect your businesses. Um, no one wants police to be defunded. No one wants to be in unsafe communities without a law enforcement presence. This was an evil narrative pushed by the far left community, and it's not healthy for our country, and it can't remain. We're seeing now that 
the Biden administration is trying to capitalize off of increased crime by saying that our weapons our, or, or gun kits, or he calls them ghost guns, uh, should, should be eliminated. Well, if crime is increasing, the one thing I want to be able to do is protect myself. Mm-hmm. I mean, that is the exact opposite of what we should be looking at and thinking through. And the Democrats are trying to use any kind of negative uh, outcome, however evil it is, to push disarming the, the broad community. And I wouldn't, I won't stand for. In fact, uh, that's one of my platform items is protecting our constitutional rights. Uh, I, I say our First Amendment is under attack, our freedom of speech, and it's, it seems to only be focused on the conservative, the conservative voice. And whenever big tech, big tech colludes with the Biden administration to suppress our voices, then they should be they should lose their Section 230 protections. And our Second Amendment is a un, I have a unique take on the Second Amendment. I call it the Life Amendment <laughs> uh, because the Constitution and Declaration of Independence was put in place to protect our God given rights, and life is one of those God given rights. And I know God, and God wouldn't give us the right to life without giving us the right to protect and, de- and defend our lives. So to me, it goes hand in hand. I would never allow our Second Amendment to be encroached upon. But, yeah, I, I think we need leaders who are, are able to speak the truth with honesty. I wouldn't want any community in our state to disarm or, be, or not be able to defend themselves. So I'm thankful for uh, what Governor, Governor Kemp signed into law recently, our constitutional carry bill. I am, too, because I forgot to get my uh, concealed carry permit <laughs> renewed, and I didn't want to go through that hassle again. So I'm delighted. <laughs> my wife is is the biggest Second Amendment zealot in the country. I don't want you near her, by the way, because y'all will start talking about guns, and, and, and the conversation oh, yeah. will, will never go. She she is she's like, you got to get your carry permit. you got to renew it. She had it on the calendar. I ignored it, and now I don't have to do that anymore. Thank goodness. <laughs> now, this relates, though, um, it, it, with with these particular issues, your issue. Um, I want to ask you really, and, and we'll spend some time here and, and let you talk about that, that issue, uh, not the one that really got you in, and, and maybe they're related, though, but uh, your issue that you see for Georgia, you get to the Senate, what is the thing that's going to galvanize you there? Uh my- <sighs> The, the one I mean, there's so many things that we need to correct from this administration. Jeez Louise. But in, in terms of prioritization, our national security and our national defense uh, tends to float up to the top. I mean, I know I know inflation is uh, is, is very important. And I, and I call it maybe a one B, one uh, A being our our security. Uh, but but prioritizing our national security is something that I want to ma- make sure I do on from day one. And some of the things I would do, I, w- I would I would push for continuance of our border wall and our border security, improving our overall um, uh, border security. I would also push for supporting our military members in uniform by banning immediately banning uh, this transgenderism and uh, critical race theory that's being taught in our in our uh, military institutions that is not okay uh, that teaches division the military is about unit cohesion and good order and discipline it's a, it's a place where a wide background of americans can come together to conform to that military standard not the military adjusting to whatever social interest of the day is i mean we're there to be to, to be warriors to be military warriors not social justice warriors and that is one of the first things i would put in place and that would, that would be a ban on this divisive type of rhetoric and these divisive beliefs that doesn't belong in our military today. And then what piggybacks to that would be our veteran care. Uh, I, I think it's a recruitment issue. If, if, if we're not focused on uh, supporting our veterans after they've oftentimes given their you know, life and limb uh, for, to protect our country, then we're, we're not doing the right thing for our our nation's uh, uh, security. So we've got to prioritize our veteran services. I mean, even in Georgia, we we have veterans that are dying from ant bites by, while waiting in a in, a in a waiting room in hospitals. We we have a a, 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 a hospital um, uh, appointment process that takes six months from the date you call to request an uh, uh, an appointment to when you're able to be seen by a doctor. That is not okay, and I would never allow. The, the degradation of our VA system. 
Well, you mentioned that. Uh, so this seat is the seat that was filled by Johnny Isaacson, and his number one issue later in life in his Senate term was VA reform. And he complained how slow it was, how bureaucratic it was. I was talking to my friend Tom Cotton uh, a couple of weeks ago about this, not not on air. We were just having a friendly conversation. We had a guy here in Georgia who was talking about these problems and the weights he's had. He's had um, mental health issues trying to get into the VA. It, it one, it doesn't seem like our, our incumbent U.S. senators from Georgia are are engaged in this issue the way Isaacson was. And two, even if they are, it it's mind-numbing to me how this thing hasn't been fixed yet. Yeah, it, it, it's insane. Uh, Eric, I think what we have to do is we, we have to put a veteran in these seats, in, in this U.S. Senate seat. It's, it's important for someone who understands the, the, the military structure, the military culture, and how to treat – our military warriors after they've served their time in these U.S. Senate seats to represent our party and our veterans. And that's that's first and foremost in my in my priority list is to make sure that I service the military members um, who serve and the military members who have served. And uh, I've been endorsed by uh, an organization called uh, the Mighty Hero Homes. They're, they're, they're in, their initiative is to build um, over 400 homeless veteran com- communities for homeless veterans across the country, with the first one being right here in Henry County uh, in Georgia. Uh, these are the kind of ideas and initiatives that I get excited about because I know how important it is to our country's sovereignty. Now, it, let, let's uh, keep this vein going. You mentioned your grandmother had been down at Robbins. Um, it, there, for those outside of middle Georgia, Robbins Air Base is near logistics facility. They have the J-STARS, which are increasingly, even the people who I talk to who work there and, and serve on those planes, they're kind of a dying technology that uh, you have the, the Air National Guard and the Air Force have been at loggerheads over trying to sort out while still trying to justify that facility, which I think we need. Uh, we've got a number of air bases and in, in military installations in Georgia. We don't have to worry any anytime soon about another one of those uh, rounds of BRAC rounds uh, that we know of th- thus far. But we've lost a seat in the House on the Armed Services Committee. Uh, it seems like we need that strong military representation within, oh, in Congress. Oh, we definitely do. And I do look forward to being on the, the um, Senate Armed Services C- uh, Committee. Uh, that's one of the top committees that I would like to serve under, uh, along with um, the Act Committee and uh, small business uh, community to, to be to be um, uh, frank. So Georgia, I don't I don't know the number off the top of my head, but we we're, we're in the top ten of states in the country in terms of veterans. Uh, we also have several military installations, and I will never vote for base realignment and closure or BRAC, um, as you mentioned, on any facilities in my home state of Georgia. Now, let's talk about the farmers. You, you mentioned the Ag Committee. Um, we had Hurricane Michael come through Georgia a number of years ago, uh, right before the Abrams-Kemp race, where she made the unflattering remarks about people in the ag industry, probably cost her some votes down there. There are still people who haven't gotten reimbursed by the federal government. Farmer suicides have skyrocketed in South Georgia as uh, banks have foreclosed on land. The farmers have a massive burden right now, in addition to a federal government that seems to want them to convert all their tractors to battery powered, <laughs> raise their cost. Uh, the, the the poultry and the beef industry, the processors are getting the money. The farmers who raise the livestock aren't getting the money. It's it, We got real problems in our just food chain going all the way down to the farmers. Y- yes, we do. And, and, and Eric, um, I have the backs of all of our farmers here in Georgia. Uh, I am the only candidate in this race that's campaigned in every county in the state of Georgia this campaign cycle. In fact, I'm the only candidate that's ever done it in uh, less than 30 days. We did it in 29 days, about six stops a day where I'm giving Good you know, Lord. P- pitches and such. Yeah, my, 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 my voice was really, really struggling during that time. But. Yeah, okay, you know, wait, <laughs> I got to stop there because there are 159 counties in this state, and, and that that's insane. Wow. <laughs> Well, we wanted to make a statement. We wanted to show Georgians that we're willing to roll our sleeves up and work hard because I know that there's a lot of hardworking Georgians here who who um, just get on the short end of the stick because our government turns their back. And, you know, we have a farm bill coming up uh, to be voting on next year in, in, in our Congress, and uh, that will be a priority to me. Uh, what we learned on this, this tour around the state of Georgia, we, 
We talked to lots of farmers. We, we, we've heard about the challenges with water rights, the challenges with, with, with owning your own land and being, being able to pass it along to your heirs without being taxed over and over again on this land. Uh, we, we also learned about the right to repair, where, where farmers aren't able to, uh, or at least without having to pay a, a, a premium, uh, repair the equipment that they, that they use because of um, certain, certain restrictions. Uh, the, these are the things that you only learn when you get out in front of people, when you're able to have conversations and, and discussions with folks around the state. It is a priority to make sure that our number one industry in Georgia, which is ag, remains our number one industry in Georgia by making sure that regulations that are throttling our farmers, throttling our growers, uh, are pushed back and doesn't inhibit growth uh, or, or, or become an undue burden on how they do business. Uh, that would definitely be a priority of mine. And, and that actually falls in line with uh, one of my platform items, items and that is uh, strengthening our our economy. I have lots of ideas on how um, how to go about that, even in this high inflationary uh, period that we're in. All right, we got to take another time out here. Before I do, though, I got to tell you guys about Patriot Mobile. They are a, a cell phone company that's actually Christian and conservative, and they contribute to the conservative cause. They're contributing to candidates around the nation. They're contributing to the First Amendment, the Second Amendment causes, and the pro life cause of the nation. They need you as a customer so they can grow their profits and give even more to the cause. And you don't have to worry about the quality of cell phone service because they use the same towers everybody else does. Right now, you get free activation with my name by going to patriotmobile.com slash Eric, patriotmobile.com slash E-R-I-C-K. You can also call them. They've got 100% U.S.-based customer service. Their phone number is 972-PATRIOT, 972-PATRIOT. Tell them I sent you. You get that free activation, and you're doing business with a company that shares your values. Patriot Mobile is explicitly Christian and conservative by design and designed to fight for the conservative cause and put their money where their mouth is. Do business with them today. Uh, PatriotMobile.com slash Eric, PatriotMobile.com slash E-R-I-C-K. And here I am. So we got microphones going. We've been talking, and and I was like, we've only got a few minutes left. It's, it's gone so fast, and we've been here an hour. So, uh, Kelvin, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn this over to you. Here it is, uh, two fifty four. We got about four minutes and fifty seconds. And <laughs> I mean, listen, thank you for coming, first of all. But I mean, make it's your sales great. pitch. It's been great. Thank thank thanks for having me here. Uh, I've I've almost talked about all three of my my platform items uh you know i talked about uh, prioritizing our national defense and our national security i've talked about uh protecting our constitutional rights i haven't talked a lot about the economy and that's an area where i'm very strong in with my business background and my business acumen uh you know that's an area that has to be a priority and i have ideas on how to get out of this terrible economic situation that we're in um by you know like i mentioned earlier keeping regulations pushed back but at the same time, we've got to figure out how to get out of, get out of this debt. Um, you know, um, $433 per month, that comes out to about $5,200 a year, is what we have to find this year or cut off of last year. That's, what, that's the hit that inflation has given to every family in our country right now. And we have to stop the spending. We've got to stop the printing of money and devaluing our dollar. But we also have to figure out how to get some revenue coming in. That's where the whole uh, uh, stopping of our energy independence and our exploration, that, that hurt our country. I think we need to utilize our natural resources right here in America. In fact, we have enough natural gas here in America to fuel all of, all of our domestic needs and to export to other countries. For instance, Europe. Right, right mm-hmm. now we understand the the, the dynamics of, of Europe, where we have Germany buy, you know, they were buying natural gas from Russia, and uh, you know, if we can supply those needs, we can cut off Russia, which is a national security threat. We can embolden, uh, uh, increase our allies, the, our relationship with our allies. All at the same time, we're bringing in revenue that we desperately need in our country to help pay out, pay down this debt. These are the types of ideas that we can implement here in our United States Senate uh, um, with a strong senator. In fact, Georgia can benefit off of that, too, because we have a Kinder Morgan plant right here outside of Savannah, we do. Elba Island, that does LNG processing, and we can export from that facility. Obviously, we need to build it out a little bit more, but these are the types of, of, uh, of business ideas that we need in our U.S. Senate tour to push and know what the heck they're talking about. I'm so concerned right now with this primary 
because Georgians have to make sure that we look at this race with clear eyes. I'm not saying that I'm, you know, I'm I'm the greatest guy since sliced bread. <laughs> you know, I'm just saying I'm the right candidate to beat Raphael Warnock. And I have the right background to serve you proudly as your next U.S. senator. Uh, my wife and I, we we have season tickets to the Braves. Uh, we, we love the Atlanta Braves. And, you know, sometimes in the late innings, you see Coach Snicker make two or three pitching changes in those late innings. Uh, we saw that during the World Series. What He's not saying that the pitchers on his bench are bad. He's just trying to put the right pitcher in at the right time to match up to that right batter to get that right out. That's all I am in this race. My background is the highest polling background. My abilities to communicate and articulate good, sound, conservative points are solid. I make cogent arguments. This is what we're going to need against a Raphael Warnock who's going to have good commercials and who's going to hit us with all these crazy attacks and try to put us on our heels. Republicans, no, we, we, don't, we don't need to be on our heels. We don't have to be on our heels. Our policies work for all Americans. We have the greatest policies out of any political party. And it's shown from Reagan. It, it, it worked with the Bush recovery. And obviously it worked under the Trump presidency. What we see from the Democrats, case in point with the Biden administration, we're in our worst four-year economic period since the Great Depression, y'all. The, the Democrats have dropped the ball. It's time for us to pick up that fumble and take it to the goal line and score. I ask that everyone in Georgia go to KelvinKing.com, K-E-L-V-I-N-K-I-N-G.com. Follow us. I ask that you pray for us because the Democrats don't like a strong voice like mine coming, coming from our party. Support us and tell your family and friends about us. 15 seconds. That's the mark. Thank you so much for joining me in studio. Kelvin King, everyone. Thank you. The regular season is heating up. New stars are emerging, and that means more opportunities to win up to 25 times your cash on prize picks. The most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection on a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's that easy. Let it fly to turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Watch your favorite players and get paid doing it this basketball season. See your entries make progress during the game or make new entries for the second half in the fourth quarter. Three pointers, assists, rebounds, and everything in between are yours for the taking. Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less, it's that easy.